Let's get started with a bit of information about myself. I got my bachelor's degree from WE from Tsinghua University in 2013. And uh, in 2015, I got my master's degree where I was working on uh, signal processing. And in 2016, I made a very big decision to switch to Professor Danroth's group. And I started my work in NLP and machine learning. Uh, uh, in, in the summer of 2017, I did an internship here in Seattle uh, at Facebook. And uh, during the 12 week internship, I launched a couple of products, models and I improved their overall ads revenue, which is a lot, uh, by roughly one point percent. Um, and as of 2019, I have passed my prelim exam, and I'm expected to graduate uh, sometime later this year. Uh, and uh, in, in each of my stage, I have got some, uh, some award I highlighted here. In, uh, when I was undergrad, I got a National Scholarship of China. And uh, in my master's degree, uh, one of my paper to IEEE ESP got into the finalist for best paper. And in uh, and 2016, in my PhD stage, I, I was also awarded the E Fellowship. And here is a list of the values of my publications in, the, in my grad life and from the area of uh, signal processing and NLP and machine learning. And I would like to highlight my signal processing experience because I think that part of experience is giving me a very solid background in math, linear algebra, statistics, especially statistical estimation. And also it gives me a philosophy of how to do research. And after I did made the big decision, uh, I, I really like the area of NLP, I really like uh, AI, and uh, I, I hope people, I, I think I'm, uh, I published a series of paper uh, on, a, on a very focused area about understanding time in natural language, and I, I think I was progressing very well. And some papers are also on the submission right now. And I really hope to continue this momentum uh, at AI2 as well. And uh, behind these publications, I usually use these kind of terms to characterize my uh, research expertise. Uh, apart from my it's not showing. Apart from my PhD work on, on, on NLP, uh, I had also uh, I had I, had, I also had experience in, in uh, spectral analysis, such as Fourier transform, and also I did signal processing in Hilbert spaces. I also had applications doing real brain science, and by the way, that is my brain, and uh, <laughs> and, and 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 it's normal at least uh, two years ago. Um, so, uh, and back further, back further, when I was undergrad, I also did uh, projects in computer vision, such as image stitching, when you hold a camera and uh, stitch all of the images you got. And also, I, I did some uh, image super resolution. Back then, it was, it was an era of compressive sensing. Right now, it's deep learning. But at that time, I did some image super resolution where I was trying to improve the resolution of a low resolution image to a high resolution image. Uh, OK. so. Uh, after this uh, brief introduction about myself, about my background, uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to come to our focus today, it's about my PhD thesis research. It's understanding time in natural language. So uh, I hope that I can have the opportunity to show you uh, one of my uh, online demos. So before we dive into the technical details, we can have a, uh, a, a, uh, a feeling of what I'm doing. So uh, here, for example, this is, an, uh, this is a snippet from a, a news article. Maybe New York Times, I forgot about the source. But uh, it's about a, a story. And uh, you can see here we, uh, we extracted the events. We extracted the time expressions. We also normalized the time expressions to a calendar date. And we also have a, um, some images. Uh, to, to show you, the, to visualize the temporal relations between all of the nodes. And also, we have a timeline. We, we compact the graph so that we can have a timeline visualization of what's going on. And the interesting thing here, you can see, so this is E0, this is E3. And you can see the index of the event is the, uh, is the narrative order. But we are not following the narrative order because we, the narrative order is rarely the same as the temporal order. So what we are trying to do is to reconstruct the temporal order from natural language text. And uh, today, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about how I, ext how I extract those nodes. Uh, I'm going to talk about if those nodes are already given, how do we construct the labels? How do we construct the graph, uh, the, the edges in the graph? OK, so, so why do I uh, work on this topic? Uh, because I think time is really a very important, uh, important dimension when we, used, uh, when we uh, describe what's going on in the world. Uh, here are two, uh, two events. People were angry, and police used tear gas. These are two events. And uh, if we know that people were angry with 
before police used tear gas. Then we can imagine that this story sounds like people are angry and ended up in a violent conflict with the police and to restore order, the police used tear gas. This is how this story sounds like given such a temporal relation between them. However, if we simply switch the order of them, uh, the events are still the same events, but this event sounds like the police used tear gas and the people were angry, were simply angry at the fact of the tear gas. So this depicts a totally different version of the story. This reminds us that uh, even if we are, seeing, we are seeing the same events, if they, if they have a different theme, a temporal order, the version of the story is totally different. So this means time is really a crucial dimension uh, to describe events and stories. So this is why uh, I'm interested in how to reconstruct the temporal relations uh, from natural language text. So how do we define a temporal relation? This is a, a, a sentence. I met with him before leaving for Paris on Thursday. Uh, we have already got three notes here. I met, a living, and on Thursday. And we know met is before living, and living is on Thursday. So it's relation called uh, before, and there is another relation called be included. And my talk today will mainly focus on how to extract such kind of relations. So a very natural extension to that is when we are given a text snippet or a, a whole doc document where there are multiple events. If we draw all of the relations in between, we will get a graph. And this is what we call a temporal graph. So in this language, what I'm going to do is to label those edges in temporal graphs. And this is a very difficult task. According to the literature, we can see for this task with gold events or without gold events, the literature with F1 was in the low 50s and low 30s. So it's very unreliable, and downstream task cannot use it as a robust signal. So it has been a, a very difficult task for a very long time. So right now, in retrospect, after I published a, a series of papers, I, I think a, this problem is challenging due to the following three uh, perspectives. Uh, interrelated events, lack of prior knowledge, and insufficient data. These are the three, uh, these three challenges are actually very general for maybe all NLP tasks. But specifically, for, for this temporal relation task, uh, the interrelated events is coming from the transitivity of temporal relations because we, if we know event A is before B, even B is before C, then A must be before C as well. So this is transitivity. And because of transitivity, temporal graphs are structured, so it gives us, it, uh, so it gives us more complication for learning and inference as well. And the second one is lack of prior knowledge. Here I have a, a specific example. More than 10 people have done something police said. Uh, a car did something on Friday in a group of men. And here I have deleted the verbs for those events, and we only have the context. Even if I ask a human being about the relation between the two events <coughs> that I deleted, it seems to be a very difficult task even for humans, because we only have the context right now. We cannot use our prior knowledge to determine the relation. If you don't understand it right now, don't worry. I will come back to this problem later. And insufficient data. Is this, always sim this seems to be a, a topic that is always true for NLP, of course. And for this task, uh, there are two reasons that I think well, we are facing the insufficient data issue. First is labor intensive, because the number of edges is quadratic in terms of the number of nodes. So it's not scalable. If you want to uh, annotate 100 events, it gives you 5,000 edges to annotate. So it's very difficult. And uh, even for each single edge, it's it, for, to label a single edge may also be very difficult. It's not like the example <laughs> I showed you very earlier. These are very, those are very easy examples. It's just a before and includes. But most of the time, we need to spend a lot of time to figure out whether there is indeed a relation or not. So these two reasons give rise to the insufficient data issue. And these are the three challenges, I think, in retrospect about why this, why this problem is difficult. And how to handle these challenges, I have been, uh, as shown in my subtitle, uh, I've been doing it from structure learning, <laughs> common sense, and data collection. Uh, so in, in, in the short way to, to describe my work in the last two years is that I improved the previous SOTA F1 score by roughly 20%. This is not a very accurate statement because we have <coughs> multiple metrics, but this is a general statement. So we improved the performance either for with gold event scenario or without gold event scenario, we improved it by roughly 20 points. Uh, with this understanding, 
I put my publications uh, on this topic in, in, in NLP and Understanding Time uh, to the three categories. And those that are both faced are the papers that I'm going to focus today. Still, I'm not going to talk about the very nitty-gritty details. I'm going to just describe the very high-level idea of, what, of the motivation and the result. And this paper online demo, uh, this was a demo I showed you just now. Uh, that was uh, a demo paper in the demo track of EMLP. OK, so let's uh, come to our first part, the structure learning. This is my EMLP paper in 2017. Uh, and the fundamental motivation for that is, as I introduced earlier, is due to transitivity, temporal relations are highly interrelated. And the, the gap, there is a gap. The existing methods often uh, only consider the interrelation in the inference time. But in the learning time, they are always doing local learning. How do I, how, what do I mean by local learning? G this is a graph I showed you earlier. And in local learning, we, we first break down the whole graph into individual edges. And for, all of, for, for each of the edge, we may do some uh, embedding or we may do some feature extraction. And for any learning algorithm, for example, perceptual, SVM, or uh, neural networks, we feed those edges individually one by one so that when, when, when we update the, the, the weights or the parameters in the learning, lear, in the learning algorithm, it's unaware of the, of the other parts of the graph other, or other parts of the structure. So this is what we call local learning. And the fundamental idea is that we are arguing that uh, local learning is not sufficient. Because uh, other events is often necessary. What, 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 why do we think of this? Uh, for example, this is a text snippet I, I showed you also sh from the earlier example. Uh, here, I'm trying. I have deleted all irrelevant information. I only show the two events, ripping and ordered, and uh, I'm trying to mimic the the process of a local learning algorithm. And uh, what what happens for a local learning algorithm? It sees the feature from the, the this pair of events and try to fit. Uh, the, the, the label provided by annotation. And we can see by annotation, by human annotation, uh, when, when people have the whole document, they have annotated the relation called before. But actually for us, if we only see the two events here, it's very difficult for our human beings, even for our human beings, to figure out what's going on here. And we don't know the relation. So what happens later? We have to fit our param we have to tune our, tune our parameters to overfit this label because this is locally inseparable. But what if we bring a third event into the game? We know the tons of earth cascaded down a hillside ripping to houses, and firefighters order the evacuation. We know ripping is included in cascaded, and cascaded is before ordered. So the relation between ripping and ordered being before, this fact is already uh, satisfied automatically. So we, even, if it does, even if our local learning algorithm doesn't support this decision, because of the structure's constraints, it's already satisfied. So we don't need to update our, learning, our, our weights or our parameters in the learning algorithm so that we are not overfitting such cases. Uh, that's a very intuitive uh, description. Here is I'm using uh, perceptron as an example to, to mathematically describe what's the difference between these two. I'm, I know lots of you uh, have already been very familiar with this, but let me just, uh, uh, just uh, quickly go over it. And for local learning, the feature and label are from a, very, from the, a single pair of events. And for global learning, it's from the whole document. And uh, uh, while learning from x and y, we can see when we update w, it's only a local decision. It's unaware of the decisions with respect to other, pa other parts of the graph. But in global learning, because we can do a global inference in each step, so that we are infusing, we are injecting the information of structure constraints into the learning algorithm. Then the problem comes to, comes to how do we solve this global learning, uh, this global inference step in the red box? The general scheme that we are using is to uh, formulate, reformulate it as an integer <coughs> linear programming, uh, where we introduce some uh, indicator uh, functions called i. And i subscript r of i and j, it, if it's 1, it means we, we think the, the relation between event i and event j is relation r. And if it's 0, we think it's not relation r. And f is a softmax score based on our uh, current estimate of the learning parameters. So conceptually speaking, we are maximizing the score of an entire graph while enforcing lots of constraints. 
And there are two types of constraints in this game. Uh, first constraint is because we introduced the indicator variables. So we have to enforce a unique constraints. It means for each, relation, for each pair, i and j, there is only one temporal relation that is valid. And the second one is exactly what we are trying to bring to the game is transitivity. So this is how we solve the uh, integer linear programming. And we, we use this as a subroutine in our global learning algorithm. And after all, after all of the learning stage finished, we also use this again to do the final prediction on our test data set. And then let's do some uh, benchmark evaluation. This was a, in the workshop of Tammy Val in 2013. Um, uh, this was one of the tasks. Um, and UT time was the, uh, was the state of the art back then. And its system was, was not available to us, so we re-implemented a perception-based algorithm. And we can see the F1 score is, uh, is, we have achieved a similar F1 score there. And later on, we used the global inference. And on top of that, we used the global learning that I just introduced. And we can see the global learning or structural learning is giving us additional performance gain, even on top of global inference. So this confirms us. This conf confirms to us about the, 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 the very original assumption or, uh, or idea that this task is structured. And if we incorporate structure learning into the game, it will give us a lot of in performance improvement. OK, so in the paper, there are lots of other details. But uh, that is the general idea about what, uh, how, we are going to, how we were using uh, structure learning for the problem. And the second part is about common sense. And I know it's a very, uh, very popular topic right now. And it's, uh, it's, um, it's my NACL 2018 paper. Uh, this, uh, the motivation of this work was uh, I realized that when event content is missing, just like this example I showed you earlier, when we ask people about the relation between them, we, we, we seem to be not un understanding at all uh, because we, we cannot use our understanding of those verbs. Here comes the, the final uh, the, the truth. If I told you that the, relation, that the two events are died and exploded, then we, it would be very easy for us to understand that what's going on here. We know died must have happened later after, after the explosion happened. This is because we can, we, now we can use the intuition. And the, the motivation that we are working on this is that we would like to include this prior information into our system as well. So how do we get this prior knowledge? Um, so I extracted one million articles from New York Times. Uh, it was from the 20 year span. And remember, I already have my own uh, temporal relation extraction. I already have my own uh, extractor. So I used that. Uh, with some manipulation, but I used that uh, and also Amazon Web Service to, ex to accelerate the process. I processed one million articles. And before we use any advanced uh, technique to get to the prior knowledge, we tried to see what about that bigram language modeling, which means for all of the w for one million articles, after we process all of the temporal relations, we threw out all of the context. We only look at the verb themselves. And, and it turns out to be very interesting that many, many interesting statistics pops up. For example, we can see ask is mostly before help, and attend is mostly after schedule, accept after propose, die after explode. I have a long, this, this is not cherry picked. I have a very long list, about 1,000 pairs like this. And, and uh, I also did some numerical analysis, but I'm, I'm not going to show them today. But one interesting thing is uh, for, for the first column, it's it's before, it's, it's, it's earlier in narrative order. In this, this is later in narrative order. So we can see that our system is our, it's, it's, it's got some, has got something. It is trying to reverse the order. So this is very interesting. It's not just following the narrative order of events. It correctly identified those relations between verbs. And here are some further, uh, seems to be a little bit small. But uh, this is, again, not cherry picked. Uh, the one I like the most, I can read for you. The one I like most is grant. So we can see t in time before grant, we, s we, we seek some grant. Maybe we know some area. We request from NSF, and we write the proposal. And after grant, we use it, and we embezzle maybe. <laughs> no, no, not true. This is pay <laughs> and, uh, and uh, help and work. So we need to work on it. I, d I don't know why work is very, very low. But, but, it's, uh, but this is from a thousand of uh, many, many other vocabularies. 
So this is the top seven uh, verbs happen most after, uh, after grant. So, so the problem comes to us, how do we incorporate this? Still, very simple ways. So this is my philosophy. If we can do it in a very simple way, so we, why not bother doing it in a very complicated way? So a simple way is that, remember, we got the bigram statistics. So for each of the pair, we already got some additional feature. So this addi additional feature is coming from our prior knowledge base. We can simply get, we can simply put or add this additional feature to our original feature set. And we can retrain our old system. So this is one way of incorporating into the learning scheme, in the learning stage. And in the inference stage, we can also do something else. Because here I have put my old formulation in, in, in gray color. And the H is the additional feature I mentioned just in, uh, in the previous slide. And we can add this as a regularization term. And we can push or we can drive the final inference result to satisfy or to, to, uh, to be close to our prior knowledge. So these are the two very simple uh, ways to, to incorporate the prior knowledge or the prior statistics in the learning and inference. And let's check some benchmark of our evaluation. The setup is slightly different, but this is more practical. So uh, the state of the art was, uh, was a system called Cable. And our EMLP paper was able, to, uh, was able to be better than that. And this was the, uh, the improvement brought by structure learning. And on top of that, if we incorporate our, our knowledge base called Temprobe, if we incorporate it into the learning system and the inference step, we can get some additional gain. So this confirms us. This confirms the idea that this problem is very re is heavily relying on the common sense, and uh, we have we have uh, we have uh, got a successful way to incorporate it into the into the game. Okay, so these are the very high level. Okay. Uh -huh. on recall, uh, but you seem to be losing a bit on precision. Yes. Is there any thought about how you can yes. hit the same level of precision yeah. as well? I, I made it very quick, and you still catch it. So uh, it's a very good question. So I also, uh, we tried to discuss this in the paper already. So uh, I didn't manipulate, manipulate, manipulate anything. What I did is just to tune the parameter using uh, cross-validation. And the metric I was, trying to, I was using to tune was based on F1. So it's very interesting why every time the best system comes from, it gives us a very low precision, high recall. And uh, later on, we, when we collect our new data set, this phenomena is very much alleviated. So this is the third part I'm going to talk about today, which is about the data set. So here, uh, all we are talking about is based on a previous data set. But later on, I decided to collect my own data set to redefine the task. And, and I think your observation, we, we, we owe the reason to, we owe that observation to some unknown issue in the data set. So the data set is not very good. And every time when we tune on the F1, it gives us a very high recall. So in your new data set, you don't see the same we, don't, we still see it, but it's very much elevated. And that is, uh, m that is in the ballpark of accept acceptable. It's not like such a big gap. Yeah. So, Sorry. Yeah. does that mean that if you actually don't tune it based on F1, you can tune it? I can tune it on, on, on precision. precision on yes. Uh, if I tune it on precision, the precision is very high. And recall is very low. And because in order to publish the paper, we need to get better F1 scores. So, uh, but we, have we, we, we indeed have done that. But that means that you, you still have the ability to actually decide the trade-off tra tra between We still the have, we still have it, yes. How big is the what? How big is the data? How big is what? The data set. The data set, I see. So this data set is very small. It's, uh, it's 10,000 relations. So it's very small. In the test set, I remember it's 1,000. Could that be the problem? What? Yes, that's a problem. And uh, uh, in, my, in my new data set, uh, I have uh, still not, not a very large data set. Uh, but I think we are, we are moving along the correct direction. Yes. OK. All right, uh, lots of good questions. And uh, I tried to escape because I, I was trying to do it very fast. But it's very good. Uh, yeah, those are the questions that uh, we got asked by the, by the reviewers as well. So, so th uh, the third part is about data collection. 
Uh, this was a ACL 2018 paper. I, I really liked this paper. Um, and it got a score out of three reviewers for uh, 355. Uh, sorry, 455. So it was a very highly uh, recommended paper. And, um, but it's very specifically related to temporal relations. So I'm still I'm going to talk about the very high level ideas. So the motivation that we decided to collect a new data set is we think we are approaching the upper bound. Uh, although we have addressed the problem from structural learning and common sense, maybe you have noticed that the numbers are still very low. It's still useless, honestly. And we think uh, the, the major reason, or the main reason, is that the quality of the data set is not very good. Uh, here are all experts. So we are using IAAs to, to evaluate the quality of data sets, right? So I checked the IAAs. Some of them are not published, so I have to write uh, an email to, their, to the authors. And I, here is a list of the numbers I got. Uh, lots of different evaluation metrics, but the IAAs are all very close to 60%. And this means the annotation task was very difficult even for human annotators. This is not good because when we read news <coughs> articles, we always think we, that we understand what's going on. We never say, okay, so I don't know whether Trump is before Obama. We never, we, we never say this. We always know the temporal relation. But why is this so difficult even for human annotators? Remember, for those data sets, the annotators were the authors themselves. So the authors, they, they are playing the game and they are also, also doing the reference job. So they are designing the annotation guidelines and they collect the data by themselves. And they ask these two of the authors, they collect the, da they collect the data individually and they don't disagree with each other, even if they discuss the guideline together. So uh, th this is the highlight of what we got. So we got, we re-annotated the roughly 300 documents from the same workshop. It's the same set of documents. And we finished the 300 documents annotation in about one week using crowdsourcing. And this one week is already very, uh, it's, it's, it's already having lots of overhead in, in to included in it. Actually, we can do much better than that. But any, anyway, I, wa I want to say that because of crowdsourcing, we can scale it up. And the IAA was improved from the previous 60% to 80%. And this 80% was from cross authors. Between our authors, ourselves, still we annotate uh, individually without talking to each other. And between our experts, the IAA was 88. So it was pretty good. And the fundamental idea is that we, we challenge ourselves by asking us to this question, is time really one dimensional? Because physically, or in physics, we know time is one dimensional, space is three dimensional. But uh, we argue that in, t in natural language, actually, there may exist multi dimensional time axis. And here is a, a text snippet. Please try to eliminate, it, eliminate the army and restore order. 51 people were killed in clashes between police and citizens. And here is my, my structure, my temporal structure. I proposed this temporal structure to represent the relations in this text snippet. First, we have the main axis. This is the, the old axis we used to work on. And this is the intention axis. This is what police tried. And uh, restore order is the intention of eliminating the army. And what we used to see that between the, rela between the events that are on the same axis, the relation is very clear. So we know police tried to do something before people got killed. And they tried before eliminate army. And they eliminate army before restore order. However, lots of confusions happen between, between events that are from different axes. For example, here, restore order and people got killed. I have asked people, different people, about the relation between them. And they say, OK, it should be before, because please try to restore order. They go there first, and people got killed. So the relation should be before. But it's, it's also reasonable to say it's after, because if people got killed, it means the order is not restored yet. So it can also be, be after. And some people who are very smart, who are very clear-headed, they say, I can imagine the two scenarios. So I just simply put a vague relation for them. So this is why people got confused and people, different people got disagreement uh, for, for lots of the relations. I know you have lots of questions, but we can all, uh, feel free to ask. But the overall performance, so once we used, so, so this, 
intention access thing, this is not the only thing. So we have a, a, a long list, not very long, six to seven uh, definitions or types of, uh, of access. And we ask people to annotate to the access first, and then we ask people to annotate to the relation within each access. And this is how we got a huge improvement on the data quality. And we tried to evaluate a machine learning algorithm on the, on the data set. And we use very simple baseline perceptual algorithms. And we use same feature set on two different data sets. And these two data sets have the same set of documents. And we evaluate on the same set of temporal relations. But of course, our new data set is re-annotated. So the labels may be different. So it's not a very fair comparison, but this is the best comparison that we can do. <coughs> and this is the result we got. On the, new, on the old data set, the performance was very low. It's about 48%. It's very close to the results I showed you just earlier. And in the new data set, it <coughs> immediately improved to 69%. So um, we are not arguing that the proposed baseline system is better. Instead, we are, proposing, we are saying that the new annotation scheme better defined the task so that it's easier to, to be learned. So this is good. And we also, on top of this data set, we also evaluated some neural methods. So this is, yes? Um, I just had a question. I, I like very much the idea of thinking of different access, uh -huh. different access in the same working language. Um, but I also wonder, would you get similar results if you took the original annotation and just you know, uh, discarded all the data from training and test and just left the new version? Mm -hmm. Right. So that is indeed something that we can, uh, that we can do. And, uh, uh, the reason that we didn't show it there is because there is some other difference between the data sets. It's about the label set. So uh, we did some uh, further evaluation on uh, how, do we, how do we human perceive the ending points of events. So uh, we, we launched two separate tasks. One is to ask people to annotate to the, the starting point relations. And the other one is to the ending point relations. And for ending relations, Nobody can, can, because if you launch a crowdsourcing, there is some uh, test or prelim exam for them to do. So they need to pass the exam first, and then they can work on your test and get paid. And when we ask people to work on the second task, where we ask people to annotate the ending points, very few people can pass the prelim exam first. And then even if they passed, half of them got kicked out during the middle, because after they passed it, they, maybe they were lucky. But in the middle, they, we, we continuously test the accuracy of them. And they still got kicked out. And also, we can see the average time uh, people spend on each question is doubled. So we realize that maybe uh, duration or ending points is something different to the relations here. Sometimes you may think ending points is very important. For example, I, I took a flight, and it landed in, in, in New York, maybe. and uh, we, we may think the flight is a uh, durational, so it's very important uh, to, to, to know the duration. But actually, the important ending points are usually marked by a second event, like landed. So the landing marked the end of the previous event called flight. So we, 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 kind, of, we kind of pushed lots of, uh, lots of things, and we only work on the very simple things. And then we can say, OK, we can, we can solve this for this simple questions first. And then we can, on top of that, we can think about new issues. That's the fundamental uh, idea we had. But that's a very good question. And let's come back to the neural methods. So for temporal relation, because relation extraction is very popular, and uh, uh, the state of the art is also, very, uh, is also uh, neural nets, use either using CNs or RNs. Uh, but for this particular task, people have also tried to use neural methods before. And they didn't get much gain. And even there is some, some work in the clinical domain, clinical temporal relation domain. They even published negative results. But right now, with my new data set, I tried some very vanilla, very simple neural methods. I use LSTM to take word embeddings as input. I use the <coughs> hidden vectors to represent the events. And I concatenate the representation for the single pair. And then I use a feedforward neural network to predict the final uh, temporal label, like before and after. And on top of that, I also use a, a, a Siamese network to, to fit my, uh, my previous knowledge base. I got some additional embeddings, and I added on top of my feedforward neural network. And this is the whole, uh, the whole structure of the neural net. 
And this is uh, the, the evaluation result. Are you, are you taking the census terms or the event prices? What, 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 is, what are the inputs here? The inputs here are the uh, word embeddings. So it's a yeah, sentence. Uh, it's a sentence, yes. Or maybe two sentences. Do, do you mark which events are? Uh, so we have multiple events inside, but we we have assumed that we know all of the events already. So, 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 so maybe there are three events. So there would be three relations, right, or among three events. So we will do it three times, right? So we we of course we have because of that of the demo you can see it's from scratch. So we have the event extractor ourselves, but uh, I didn't show it here. Okay, so. What? So how difficult is extracting the events Right. Uh, this is a very good question. So uh, generally speaking, it's a, mu it's a much easier task compared to temporal relation. But one, one issue is because we have defined a complicated structure called multi-axis. So the, the, the next question is, how difficult is that? And uh, I have tried to do something, and it's still very easy. So uh, I did some uh, system evaluation. To, to try to classify the act different events to different axes, and that part is still very reli reliable. It's, a, it's in the high 80 range. That's what I can say. And this is the evaluation. The Qualcomm time is the demo I just showed you, and this is, a previous, this is our previous state of the art. And this is to use, uh, and the second bar is to use LSTM without using the Siamese network, and also it is using the standard uh, word to vac or glove or fast text. And we can see it gives us some roughly three point gain. And if we replace that part to Elmo or Bert, and it's very good to see that Bert is actually not beating Elmo so <laughs> on this task. So the, this bar is averaged in be between the two, but these two not deviate from each other by more than a point to two or point to three points. So it's very similar. So using AMOA BERT, it gives us additional three point scan. And by incorporating Siamis network, that is uh, how we incorporate the prior knowledge, we got further three point scan. And the three, the three uh, labels are just the three metrics, three different metrics. Uh, I'm not going into the details, but for you to know it, it's uh, the higher the better. So in total, our best system right now is better than our previous best system called ComTime by roughly 10 points in accuracy, 10 points in F1 score, and six points in the so-called awareness score. OK, so I need to check the, oh, OK, sorry. Uh, OK, so how many time do I have? Uh, it's 40 now? OK, 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 I see. So uh, after, my, uh, after I give the very high level description of what I have done for my thesis work, I'm going to talk about, about my vision because uh, I'm here to do things. So I need to talk about what I'm going to do. And I, I recently I came across a book by uh, Ju, Juer uh, Harari, The Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. I really like the idea about the development of language. It's really a milestone for humankind. Because of language, we can gossip. We can believe in things that we've never seen. And uh, we can, we can uh, build uh, hierarchies. And that's why we humans are the dominant species on the planet. And I think with language, the most important thing, all of that, the gossip or the imagination stuff in the book, is it because we are able to think and talk abstractly. And this is a very important uh, characteristic of language. And I think it's a fundamental intelligence that, we, that our ancestors managed to develop over the whole, over the whole history. And I think natural language will be, the, will be the core communication channel between human and AI, which is not true right now. Now we hire so many programmers to, communic to help people to communicate with AI. And we, it's very hard to teach AI to, or teach machines to think and to, to learn the semantics of natural language. And I think the, the, the main reason, maybe, maybe you agree or not agree, uh, it's because we, have, we never have enough data. No matter how much data you collect, we never have enough data. So this reminds me about, because I, I also have a baby, I try to observe how babies are learning things. And I realize that we, human learn, we, we humans, we are learning from very limited data by self-learning. Uh, let me introduce a very interesting psychological experiment uh, I read sometime earlier. 
This is a, the Egyptian hieroglyph of owl, of the animal owl. And in this experiment, the researchers asked the people to, to draw things sequentially. They need to teach the next person using their own drawings. And the next person need to draw it by himself and teach it to the next, next person. And this is the first drawer. And it's very close. We can see it. And the second one is a reasonably good job. And then something crazy happened. Uh, the the, the very last picture, I, I, I cannot see why it is a, a copy of the first one. And then things became out of control. Um, we, we, we started from, from an owl, and we ended up in a cat. So I think I'm trying to think about what, what's wrong, what's going wrong here. And I think the reason is that we don't have any restrictions or guidance to do this self-learning process. And let me get back to my, to my work. So my, my existing work on temporal relation extraction, I was trying to move forward towards structure learning, common sense, and an annotation. And I think these are all restricting what we can do. For example, structure is restricting us from predicting loops in time. And common sense, it's telling us, if you are going to annotate attack and wound, I don't care for each particular example. But I, what I care is that after you annotate one million times, I need to see that attack happened mostly before wound. So this is also a kind of restriction or guidance. And our annotation is more straightforward. Annotation directly tells us the label for, for each of the edge. And these three components, I think, can be very general. Uh, we, can, we can learn structure from physics. And this is also how we humans learn structure from elementary school. And for common sense, maybe we can also view language models as a common sense. It tells us, after a sequence of words, here is a list of another words that may happen mostly after this sequence of words. So this is also some language model. It's it not, not necessarily language. For example, my event temporal ordering model, it can also be viewed as a language model. So it's all common sense. It's all giving us guidance about how to do inference and how to do self-learning. And an annotation, it doesn't need to be a very ideal, perfect annotation. It can be indirect signals from different machine learning tasks, or very noisy, like cross-sourcing, and also from a different domain. So I think, my, I think the, all of these are, are old words, but I think uh, supervision not only comes from annotation. Actually, supervision can also come from structure and common sense as well. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to study the center of the three components. So this is the center. This is what my, my advisor used to call, and he's also calling it right now, is uh, incidental supervision. And I, I'm very interested in the theoretical and, a, and, a, and practical aspects of how to do incidental supervision from the three uh, perspectives. And also, I really like the saying on, on, the, on the website of AI2, it's, it's a vision without execution is hallucination. And uh, I have done something, and it's also some uh, recent summations. I'm trying to study the effect of structure on annotation. What do I mean here? The same sentence, I met with him before leaving for Paris on Thursday. So we know, assume that we already know the relation of before and included. And then let's assume that we are going to annotate the, the document for someone else. And, we and this edge comes to us. And what we need to do, we need to think about, OK, so is it before or is it included? But the, but the, but the question is, for this particular edge, it cannot be chosen from the whole label set. Right now, there are only two labels that are valid, only before or included, because the relation is restricted by other two relations. So the, question, the first question is, is this red link less informational? And if it, if it is indeed less informational, do we really need to annotate this? So this is a, this is a, a, a trade-off between completeness and coverage. So here is a preliminary uh, investigation of what I did. I tried to compare complete versus partial. In the training phase, uh, we still, we still uh, want to have a, a completely, completely annotated data set called T0. But on top of that, we are given some additional budget to annotate things. So there are two schemes. The first scheme is to, uh, for every graph you see in the, in the process, you annotate it fully and before we move on to the next one. Because we only have a very limited budget, the cost is that we cannot cover all of them. We are leaving some of the structures totally untouched. 
But for partial, we, we annotate all of the structures we have at hand, but at the cost that all of them are only partially annotated. So we learn from both data sets, and we test on the same, of course, the test set is fully annotated. And we test on the same test set. And here's what we got. We got, we got the observation that partial annotations may lead to better performance. And this is due to structure. Because, because of structure, the information provided by extra edges in the fully annotated scheme is less and less informational as you, as you progress. So we, we try to make the full usage of, the, uh, of, lim of a limited budget. And this is what I'm trying to say, that here is why we think structure itself is a supervision. Because of the supervision, it gives us more things from the partially annotated data. And that's why the, 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 the second scheme B is consistently better than scheme A, which is, which is complete. So this is my uh, some uh, uh, recent work. Uh, on, the, on the joint area of structure and annotation. So what about common sense? So I also did some further, uh, evaluation, uh, further investigation on the common sense part. So uh, my old temporal knowledge base was only about the temporal ordering information. And after some discussion with lots of peers, and we realized that there are, we, we categorize temporal common sense into the following uh, in addition to the ordering, so in, in total, it's five categories. For example, duration. How long did it last? We, we, we humans, we know it's a few minutes or a few seconds. It can never be a few years. But we know a trip to China may take you a few hours or a few days. And stationary versus transient. Like we, we humans, we know the stage name is rarely changed. So if she was known as the name Fontaine, she is known as Fontaine today, maybe most likely. An absolute time point and frequency. For example, we know we usually go on trips like twice a year or several times a year, but not, not twice an hour. So what we did exactly is we collected such pairs of Q&As. Uh, we collected 10,000 QA pairs uh, on the temporal common sense. We equally distributed the 10,000 to all of the five categories. So each of the category has about uh, 2,000 uh, QA pairs. And we evaluated some, uh, some systems. First, random, it's, it gives us about 40% F1. And human, we ask people, we ask human to annotate it. And, we, and human achieved about 93%, it's very good. And bird is somewhere in between. And 70% is actually pretty good already. And we look at the data, it's not very noisy. It's already giving us lots of sense. Like it tells us, it correctly tells us how, ma how many, how long does it take for you to run a circle. And we did a, a very interesting experiment comparison. We, 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 we asked the bird to make a prediction without looking at the original sentence at all. What does that mean? So the bird only takes the question text and the, the, answer, uh, the answer text and trying to predict whether that answer is answering that question. So the performance of bird only drops by 1%. So this is exactly what we, what we call common sense, because it answers a question without looking at the context at all. So uh, here also there is another very interesting observation that, uh, as, as I mentioned, a bird can correctly classify that a few seconds or a few minutes is the correct answer for running. However, if I, if I change the answer numerically, uh, I can change it to be uh, 3,000 seconds. And Bird still says yes. So this is very reasonable, because, we can, because Bird is basically a language model and is trying to get some correlation. And without structure, so this, is, this structure is about numerical values. Without, we without putting structure inside, it's, gonna f it's always going to be s learning from sparse data. For example, we never see from a large corpus saying like, I, I, wrote, I, I finished my homework yesterday within 3,343 seconds. We never see sentences like this. So this is how, if, if, imagine if we ask Bert, OK, so I just change it from three seconds to three hours, or three seconds to, to 30 or 30,000 seconds. Bert only looks at the, at the unit. And the numerical value doesn't make any sense to Bert because it, it's very sparse. So it's very interesting to, to move forward on this area as well. Uh, so finally, I'm going to uh, finish my, my talk today. And uh, really thanks for the, for the patience and for, because I'm really talkative. And uh, thanks for 
Thanks for asking so many good questions. And I really look forward uh, that I maybe I can work for here. Thanks.